The rows of closed shops on the streets of Hong Kong tell a bleak story. This once bustling economic hub is now visibly declining. Before the pandemic, these commercial areas were packed with people. Now, only a few passerby remain, and the former hustle and bustle is gone. How deserted are the streets of Hong Kong right now? This is Granville Road in Tim Sha Tui on a Monday, a tourist area that used to be a prime location where it was hard to find a store available for rent. Today, I'm going to show you how many shops have closed down. I filmed this around 12 noon, which is typically when most stores are open, so the chance of them being closed is quite low. Just on the street alone, 37 stores have closed down, and this number might not even be accurate since I didn't count the ones upstairs. The actual number could be higher. The situation for brick and mortar stores in Hong Kong is bleak. The high rents have crushed the future of physical stores here. Apart from a few tourist areas that still get some decent foot traffic, other places are barely seeing any customers. The iconic neon signs of Hong Kong are almost all gone. In just a few years, Hong Kong has changed so much that I barely recognize it. Even on weekends, Long Kwai Fong is nearly empty except for a few foreign customers, and this is in the central tourist area. It's even worse in residential areas of Shuang Wang. Hong Kong's economy might really be in trouble. After years of political reforms by the Chinese government and the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, many believe Hong Kong's economy would recover this year. However, recent data from S&P Global Ratings shows otherwise. In May, Hong Kong's Purchasing Managers Index dropped to 49.2, this marks the third month in a row that it has stayed below the critical 50-point mark. This suggests that business expectations remain grim, dealing another blow to the economy. Wholesale and retail business owners are saying that the situation is still dire, with little hope for improvement. Recently, 190,000 people have left Hong Kong, and the total count is now 530,000. Out of those, 83% are middle class. This is the reality of Hong Kong. My store is right here and I'm barely managing to pay rent. I'm planning to move back to mainland China to continue my business. I still have some high-end furniture and appliances in the store, so if anyone's interested, feel free to come and take a look. Mr. Zhang, who has run a wholesale fabric business in Sham Shui Po since 2008, once thrived thanks to China's economic boom. His business used to receive a steady stream of orders from both mainland China and overseas. But as production costs in China went up, Many Western brands moved their manufacturing to Southeast Asia. At the same time, the economy in both mainland China and Hong Kong has remained weak, leading to a sharp drop in demand for wholesale fabrics. Mr. Zhang said, after the pandemic, it feels like the economy hasn't recovered at all. This year's revenue has improved a bit, but it's still down by 50% compared to pre-pandemic levels. Back then, business was good enough to live on, but now it's really bad. The overall economic situation is tough, Many of my long-term clients have disappeared, and some have even gone out of business, so sales have fallen. He also mentioned that poor sales have made him more cautious when buying new stock, leading him to cut his purchases by half. Many fabric wholesalers are in the same position, which has significantly impacted the entire supply chain. The fabric wholesale industry is struggling, and the garment wholesale industry isn't doing any better. Mr. Lee, who has been in the denim wholesale business in Hong Kong for over 40 years, is facing a crisis he's never seen before. Mr. Lee said, Before the pandemic, we could export a whole container of goods on busy days. Now we can't even sell 10 pairs of jeans a day. This is mainly due to changes in lifestyle and shopping habits. When the economy is bad, people prioritize food and housing. If those needs aren't met, how can they afford new clothes? Besides, people in Hong Kong already own plenty of jeans. In tough times, why would they buy more? The local market in Hong Kong is sluggish, and the export trade isn't faring any better. In April, the Hong Kong government reported that total exports reached nearly 379 billion Hong Kong dollars, a 3.7% increase compared to April 2023, adding almost 40 billion Hong Kong dollars from last year. However, this figure still represents a drop of more than 50 billion Hong Kong dollars compared to March 2023 when exports were 384 billion Hong Kong dollars. Based on trends from previous years and the historically low export figures during the April to August slow season, it's unlikely that the export trade will see significant improvement in the coming months. Mr. Lee explained, there's almost no export business left. In the past, Hong Kong's garment industry held a significant global position,
but now it's become a sunset industry. Foreign buyers used to come to Hong Kong to source goods, but now they don't need to. They have factories all over the world, which makes it cheaper for them to source products elsewhere. Hong Kong has lost its advantage. As China's status as a world's factory weakens, Hong Kong's wholesale and export industries are also declining. The retail sector faces an even bleaker future. Instead of bouncing back after the pandemic, Hong Kong's retail industry has suffered further, impacted by high rents, rising wages, and the full reopening of borders. The reopening of borders has also led many Hong Kong residents to shop abroad during weekends or holidays. Some have even emigrated, leaving the local market behind. As a result, the retail sector is performing worse than it did during the pandemic. Public data from the Hong Kong government shows that in April, retail sales fell to 29.6 billion Hong Kong dollars, marking the first time since 2023 that this figure dropped below 30 billion Hong Kong dollars. Both the retail sales value and volume indices saw their lowest year-on-year -year declines, with rates of negative 14.7% and negative 16.5%, respectively. Mr. Chen, who opened a toy boutique in a busy area of Kowloon with friends during the pandemic in 2021, initially did well. His shop, which sold locally-themed toys and genuine anime models from Japan, even expanded into a second branch. But after the pandemic, sales plummeted, and his revenue is now down by 20%. He said, Old customers now go directly to Japan to buy toys because a yen is cheap. Prices abroad are lower than in Hong Kong, so of course business is down. In the past, by 11 a.m., we'd already have people lining up outside asking when we'd open. Now, even at noon on a Saturday, there aren't many people around. We used to make five or six hundred dollars by 12 p.m., but now we only make a little over 100 in the whole morning. In fact, there are fewer shops at any time of day. Once, on a Wednesday, we made only $500 all day, not even enough to cover one employee's wage. Commenting on the dire state of Hong Kong's retail industry, Mr. Cheng said that poor government management has made it even harder for retailers to survive. He said, the government's plastic bag levy has caused a lot of trouble for retailers across Hong Kong. We've had to spend more on new packaging bags, which has significantly increased costs. Plastic bags printed with our store name used to be a great way to advertise, but now the government requires us to use their bags, which reduces the promotional effect. If the government would stop causing so much hassle, store owners in Hong Kong could save themselves. Unfortunately, this government is no longer what it once was. Hong Kong's real estate and financial sectors have also been affected by China's economic downturn. The wave of mortgage defaults in mainland China is now showing up in Hong Kong, and the continued collapse of Chinese banks is impacting the city's banking sector. Mortgage defaults in mainland China are increasing, and similar trends are being seen among Hong Kong homeowners. In August, the number of foreclosed homes in Hong Kong rose to 344, breaking the record of 316 set during the 2008 financial crisis. This marks a 30% increase from the same period last year, with the total value of these properties reaching 3.5 billion Hong Kong dollars. Out of these foreclosures, 251 are residential properties, accounting for 80% of the total. Over 40% of these homes were financed by financial companies, and there is a significant increase in high-interest second mortgages. Louis Chan, Vice Chairman of the Asia-Pacific Central Line Property Agency, believes this is due to the government lifting property cooling measures at the end of February. While the market initially rebounded, the effect quickly wore off, and the number of foreclosed homes began to rise again. With slow economic recovery and no interest rate cuts in sight, this trend is expected to continue. The lifting of cooling measures hasn't had much impact because the real issue is low consumer confidence. This can't be fixed by political policies alone. What's needed are economic policies that benefit the public, but the Hong Kong government, under the CCP, seems unwilling to provide them. China's debt problem is also fueling the wave of bank failures. Robin Harding, a Financial Times columnist, noted that People's Bank of China has taken a different approach compared to other central banks. While other banks have been easing monetary policy, China's central bank has pushed up long-term government bond yields and publicly criticized some rural banks for buying government bonds. However, due to the sluggish stock, real estate, credit, and deposit markets, government bonds have become the preferred investment for many. This is a sign that China's bond market is issuing urgent deflation warnings. The number of financial institutions in China has significantly decreased in recent years, dropping from a peak of 4,607 in 2019 
to 4,490 in 2023, a reduction of 117. This year alone, at least 50 small and medium-sized banks have dissolved. These include Bank of Dongguang, which was approved in July to acquire Dongguang Chang'an Village Bank and set up new branches. On June 20th, Dongguang Bank also merged with two other village banks, and Liaoning Rural Commercial Bank merged 36 rural small and medium-sized banks on the same day. Meanwhile, the Chinese government reported that the national non-performing loan ratio for the second quarter of 2024 was 1.56 percent, down by 0.03 percentage points from 2023. Despite this slight improvement, depositors in some rural banks, such as those in Hebei, have struggled to withdraw funds since 2022. Several banks in Zhejiang, Shandong, Shanxi, Hebei, Liaoning, and Guizhou have announced lower transaction limits for non-counter channels. Other banks, including the Bank of China and Hua Xia Bank, have also made similar adjustments. Feedback from mainland Chinese internet users show that many bank customers have had their bank card limits reduced to 5,000 yuan. Some accounts also have non-counter transactions limited to 1,000 yuan. Some banks in Hong Kong are also becoming more China-leaning under the influence of the mainland. Hansen Bank in Hong Kong has been affected by Chinese commercial real estate loans. Its non-performing loan ratio has risen to 5.3%. The Hong Kong Monetary Authority reported that the classified loan ratio for the city's banking system also increased to 1.8%. According to economist La Ka Chung, credit default swaps are a key indicator of a bank's risk of default. If a bank is close to bankruptcy, its CDS price rises sharply. Fortunately, data from Mac Rover shows that the CDS prices for London-listed HSBC Holdings and Standard Chartered Bank in Hong Kong have only dropped by 0.09% over the past month. This suggests that there is no immediate sign of a crisis. For people in Hong Kong and around the world, the big question is how governments would handle depositors' losses if a bank collapses. The U.S. offers the highest protection, guaranteeing deposits of up to 250000 U.S. dollars. In the U.K., a popular destination for Hong Kong immigrants, the protection limit is £85,000. Hong Kong's guarantee covers up to 500000 Hong Kong dollars, and mainland China promises protection deposits up to 500,000 yuan. However, in 2022, many depositors at rural banks in Henan province couldn't withdraw their money. They were forced to take to the streets in protest. Some were assaulted, beaten, or illegally detained. Authorities kept them under close watch, and many have still not recovered their savings. In contrast, when the Silicon Valley Bank in the United States collapsed in March 2023, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation announced that all depositors, insured and uninsured, would get their money back. To keep its UK subsidiary running, Silicon Valley Bank sold it off to HSBC for one pound. This move protected all depositors. This raises concerns about whether Hong Kong, influenced by China's political and economic factors, might start following China's approach in dealing with depositors. Only time will tell. Recent data from the Hong Kong government shows the city's economy is still struggling and may continue to worsen. In the first four months of this year, Hong Kong's fiscal deficit has reached 135 billion Hong Kong dollars. This is almost the entire deficit forecast for the year and 33% higher than last year's total deficit. Spending is nearly three times higher than revenue and fiscal reserves have fallen below 600 billion Hong Kong dollars, dropping to a level not seen in 14 years. Over the past few years, the government has issued bonds to generate revenue and spent hundreds of billions on infrastructure and events yet the bad economic news keep coming. Former iCable financial channel head Yang Baogang believes Hong Kong may face an even worse economic depression than before. He said, In recent months, the government has relied on exports, but everyone knows it's mainly from electronic products. This could even be due to the West increasing orders before imposing further sanctions. Future growth and exports is unlikely. With consumer investment down, the economy is clearly moving towards depression as the labor force stabilizes with fewer workers. Unemployment could rise sharply. Hong Kong's economic decline is a result of changes in its political and economic environment. American political scientist Cheng Xiaonong points out two main reasons. First is the price Hong Kong is paying for the CCP's imposition of the national security law. He explained, the CCP's rule in mainland China is defined by a strict authoritarian grip that allows no space for anti-government movements. After regaining control of Hong Kong, the CCP naturally began applying the same model, 
gradually eliminating political freedoms. As a result, the CCP has been steadily squeezing the space for pro-democracy activities in Hong Kong. This shrinking space for democracy also includes the loss of economic freedom. As the CCP stripped Hong Kong of its freedoms, the world stopped viewing Hong Kong as separate from mainland China in trade matters. At this point, Hong Kong no longer has any freedom in its market economy and will also be subjected to sanctions from various developed countries. The second reason is that Hong Kong's economy has become dependent on China. Chang explained, once China's economy sinks, Hong Kong will suffer. China's economy has been in trouble since 2015 due to a massive real estate bubble. The pandemic masked the full extent of this downturn. We are only now seeing clear signs of China's economic decline. U.S. think tanks and Wall Street didn't expect China's economy to collapse this fast. Worse off, some of China's real estate giants have blatantly defaulted on their dollar bonds. In this situation, Hong Kong's two economic pillars, its stock market and financial services, are being hit from both sides. On one hand, China's economic downturn is affecting Hong Kong directly. On the other hand, sanctions from the U.S. and other countries on China are hurting Hong Kong as well. With Wall Street cutting off investments in China, Hong Kong's stock market can no longer enjoy the shared benefits. This sudden halt in capital means Hong Kong's status as a global financial hub is under threat. For the past decade, Hong Kong's financial industry has relied on Wall Street for capital. Now that this flow of money has stopped, it's no surprise that Hong Kong's economy is in steep decline. This raises the question, is Hong Kong's economic downturn the result of the CCP's policies? Without its special status in trade and finance, Hong Kong could end up just like another second-tier city in China. Thank you.